in the next couple of weeks. But um, okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to shift gears. Okay, we spent since the start of classes spent most of the time talking about the kind of biology, ecology of weeds. We now will move into where we are going to put what we picked up, you've picked up, into practice, which is. So what? what? Why did we have to know all this seed bank stuff? Why did we have to know if the plant was, you know, was rhizotomous or not? Why did, you know, did I ask them you know, some of those questions even on the prelim? And that's because this is really what you, a lot of you are going to be working with. You're going to be working with growers or stakeholders that want you to come, out, come up with um, you know, some management strategy for your um, particular weed problem. So um, from now on, we move to, to management. Okay? And I'll just give you an overview of the various management tactics, and then afterwards in the upcoming classes, we'll go through each of the, the major categories of management and talk a little bit about how they relate to, to, um, to weed management, okay? So what we're going to talk about today then, and that's your chapter seven, is I want to give you a little bit of a history of weed control measures, you know? So have we been doing biocontrol for a long time? Have we been doing cultural control? Okay, in terms of from weed management perspective, what about herbicides? When did they first get, you know, become a big part of ag? Is it something that was there in the 1800s or not? Okay, and then I want to talk a little bit about all these strategies. Okay, both their limitations, their advantages, why people are so interested in using them, but also what are some of the limitations in, in kind of in a broad view because then we'll go through each of the categories, each of the, the, the tactics in more detail. Okay, and finally, as in everything, you cannot dismiss the economic considerations. Something might make sense agronomically, biologically, but if economically it, it, it's just not going to cut it, you're going to have difficulties implementing it. Okay? So, and this is where you're seeing, if you're wondering, this is a picture that John Duxbury took in, in India, where they're actually, this is uh, amaranth, the pigweeds. They're actually cultivated, okay? And they're, they're eaten, okay? And here's a. Uh, one of the Mennonites uh, down in Pennsylvania using, you know, horse-drawn uh, tillage implements. And this is obviously some, one of our cultivators after crops come up. So um, this is a little bit of a history, okay? And again, uh, you know, don't get bogged down on the exact dates or anything, but just want to give you an idea of, generally speaking, at, well, we have all these figures look the same. There's energy percentage, you know, how much energy which equals, you know, how important was that tactic, okay, at that time of year. And it gives you a quick um, synopsis of various key periods, okay. So generally speaking, 10,000 B.C. is when, you know, agriculture, the kind of the first, um, you know, settlements and, and uh, you know, uh, crop management occurred. This is generally accepted as, as the kind of start of ag. And how were people, weeds were, have always been around. I mean, in that, in that sense. So what were they doing? Mostly, you know, hand, hand pulling. I mean, it was really, you know, laborious, tedious type work. I mean, if any of you have, you know, hand weeded, you know what that's like. But that's what it was like. So you get to about 1,000 BC, now where you, you start seeing animal power. So you're using, um, you know, uh, animals, particularly, um, you know, uh, ox, oxen. Uh, you're using horses, okay, to till the land, but again, look at humans, okay? So humans are still, by far, okay, the main method of controlling weeds, okay? And this you could say, you know, agriculture in general, you know, agronomy. And then you move to 1731, okay? Uh, row crop cultivation, okay? You still have no mechanical power. It's basically animals. Animals are coming up, okay? You're now getting more, you know, row crop. You're not just throwing mixed seeds. You're growing things in rows, generally speaking, okay? And it's not until the 1920s that we get our first, okay? So, so 1730s, 18, you know, 1800s, you're starting to get the agricultural revolution kind of thing, you know, implements starting to be used. But really, it's in the 20s that you get mechanical power, okay? So this is where tractors were introduced into agriculture. So it's only from the 1920s. It might sound like it's a long time ago, but it's, you know, not even, t you know, 100 years, okay? And so, um, so this is, now you're starting to get more of a split, and it's not until the mid-40s, really after World War II or during World War II, where we see the, the first, okay, herbicides come in, synthetic herbicides, okay? Not, you know, inorganic, 
synthetic that have been actually produced by, you know, chemists and so forth. So now you're starting to see the human, you know, amount of, of, of labor drawing, you know, coming down. And again, this is for the U.S. Don't, it's not exactly the same, obviously, for developing countries where hand labor is still a big part of it, okay? And we finally get to, to the 1980s, and as you could go up to 2000, uh, you know, human power or energy that's been put into weed man is relatively low in most of our agricultural systems. That's not to say it does vary if you're with an organic system, say, versus conventional, but even nonetheless, it's relatively low. Animals generally have been eliminated. There are small groups of farmers, again, you know, Mennonites and so forth, that will still use horses and so forth, but that's really, really low. It's really tractors and herbicides. And I would say that if you look in here, herbicides, I would use, say that we're also biotech, 1990s, 1995, the first of our transgenic crops were introduced, okay? But that still would be under the herbicide category. So if I were to redraw this for 2008, the herbicides here would probably be up here, okay? Even though we, there's organic agriculture, say, well, they, they use mostly mechanical control. That's still only 5% in terms of acreage. Organic agriculture comprises only 5% of all of our ag activity. So 95% of agriculture crop production is still conventional. It uses, whether it's integrated pest management, but herbicides are still a big component, okay? So not, not to say the trend isn't changing, but this, these would be the two main methods of weed control. Herbicides, including, you know, Roundup Ready systems, transgenic crops, and uh, mechanical control. And for our organic growers, that is the, one of the main categories, okay? And this is where we also see in the 80s the whole integrated control, integrated weed management, okay? That becomes important, saying, hey, you know, you can't rely just on one strategy. You really need to be thinking rotation. You need to be thinking putting in varieties that are more competitive, okay? Watch how you fertilize the soil, not to feed the weeds, but to feed the crop. All that now starts really coming along, and so does biological control, and we'll talk a little more about this, okay? So just get a sense of when things were brought in. So, you know, you didn't have mechanical control, and in fact, what's happened is um, from, since the advent of herbicides, I'd argue that we've lost a lot of our skill in mechanical weed control. Some of our best farmers have retired that were really skilled in using cultivators and, and tillage implements, and there's very few now that can do it. And that's one reason why, through the agricultural sciences major, we've actually introduced an, an introductory ag machinery course at Cornell. And this, this fall is the first time it's being offered. Because although a good number of our students that are from farm backgrounds do have a good um, understanding and certainly have the experience to, to be able to use mechanical or you know, farm equipment, more and more of our students don't have that background. And, and we see it with our farmers because they've been relying on herbicides so much that cultivation doesn't become a big deal. So, and that is coming back because of herbicide resistance issues. So if any of you get a chance, you know, you're not, you're not familiar with, with equipment and, and cultivation equipment, this would be a good chance to get that hands-on skill here at Cornell before you hit the, the, uh, the job market or head back home. Yes? No, every fall. It's limited to 15 students. I think, Rob, you're in it this year. Um, and, and, you know, again, those that have the background, you, you know, you, I don't know how, Rob, you would probably, they already know some of it, but you're still picking up a lot of stuff because we have folks that have been doing this for 40 years telling, and you get on the equipment. It's not just, you know, theoretical. It's, you know, putting the equipment on. So, yeah, if any of you, and we'll, we'll post that again. Um, it's, right now it's under a special topics. It's AgSci, Hort, an XI Hort CSS course, special topics. But we're hoping to continue that, and it's 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 exactly for, and that's that's been driven by students, at, you know, telling Cornell faculty and, and administrators that they would like to have a course like that because they're getting on farm, and grower tells them, you know, do this, and they have no, you know, they can't even get on a tractor, and there's nothing wrong. I mean, I was a perfect example. Okay, if you're not from a farm background or never had a chance, it's difficult. But what I'm saying is that's going to come in handy not just for general agricultural production, but particularly as we rely on more and more perhaps on, on mechanical control, despite the high fuel costs. Okay? This is the same kind of thing, but giving you a sense of how many people it would take. So crop energy output for, per farmer, or the number of people fed by one farmer. Okay? In 1000 BC, you basically fed yourself. 
you couldn't feed other people. You just had enough for yourself. That energy that you expended was really, okay, for yourself. As, as new techniques, better management strategies in agriculture came in, you know, an individual farmer could feed two people and so forth. Such that by the 1990s, for every grower we have, generally they're able to feed 75 people, okay? And that is why, you know, in some many ways, you now have, a, you know, very few farmers, and they typically have to be large farmers, very large operations, to feed the vast majority of the population that's shifted from rural to urban, okay? We're seeing exactly the same trend in developing countries. As people are moving to cities, which is disastrous, as you can imagine, uh, looking for work and fewer and fewer folks to work the land. And that is, and the reason we're able to have this is because we do have mechanical control and herbicides. Otherwise, if it was going to be hand weeding at the kind of scale we're talking about, it would be almost impossible. Okay, I'm not saying that that's, there's anything wrong with doing that, but that is what it's, what it's allowing 75 people to, to do other things is to have the one farmer doing that, and that's increasing. Okay. The problem there, of course, is we have more and more people that have very little understanding of where their food comes from, okay? Um, you know, what's involved in growing food, food safety, unless they hear it on the news and more and more people are aware of it because they're seeing their food prices go up, oh, you know, or, or there's contamination going, oh, I didn't realize that some wholesaler from one place you could, you know, 25 states and three countries could get a, you know, contamination of a product. So that's kind of a, you know, we're seeing that, a kind of rebirth of people asking you know, where's, you know, agriculture, Ooh, maybe we should think about that a little more. And there's actually been um, some debates as to, you know, just like you have to take social sciences, humanity courses, there's actually a move to have an introductory agriculture course mandatory for all students in college as a way to, hey, oxygen, water, and food is what, you know, sustain folks. So, you know, and most of you, I don't have to convince you that that's an important aspect, but think about friends and family who may have little understanding of where their food comes from. That's important. And this is because of this. Okay? So you guys are going to be in a prime spot to, to really influence where things are going to go as, as food becomes an issue, both here in the U.S., but worldwide. So it is, this is the time to be in here, you know, trying to make a difference. Um, specifically related to weeds, I just want to show you what happens when you introduce certain herbicides. And, and what this is, this is for Britain. Uh, 1940s, just remember, the first herbicides came in, okay? And the first herbicide was 2,4-D. And you may, may not know, but 2,4-D is used to control broadleaf weeds in turf or in cereals. So it doesn't hurt the, the, uh, the cereals, the monocots, but it selectively, and that's what's neat, selectively controls broadleaf weeds like plantain, dandelion, okay? And so what happens is when they introduce the product, you start seeing the broadleaves go down. And you looked at, you know, so they surveyed all the, you know, 24 d was coming in, this is what was happening. But what happened, of course, heavy reliance on just one herbicide or a group of herbicides that have the same mode of action, of course, they didn't control the grasses, so the grass weeds went up, okay? And they're, they're still, now we, we did introduce some graminicides or herbicides specifically controlled grasses. And you'll see that in labs, in the labs that we're gonna be, um, putting together for you how some of these products are so specific. I mean, they'll clean out barnyard grass and foxtail and, you know, not touch even, you know, turf, for example. So monocots and so forth. But this is, this is what happens, okay? And so you, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here is for every kind of method that you're going to put together, recognize that you're going to shift the weed community. Be prepared for that. You're not going to eliminate. So, if you do cultivation, you're going to get rid of your annuals, okay, or your perennials, but your annuals are going to be there because they're adapted to that kind of growth. You go to no-till, what happens? You get biannuals and perennials becoming dominant species. So just be prepared, and this is what, I, what I'm saying. You know, if you read the literature, okay, when 2,4-D came out in the er late 40s, early 50s, you read the literature and scientific literature about weeds, and people were saying there would be no weed problem. Weeds would be controlled. The silver bullet, we've got the herbicide, it's clean, no problem. It's the same kind of thing that I'm hearing with, you know, transgenics, okay? Oh, they're going to solve the, you know, world famine and so forth. I'm not saying that that's not good. I see transgenics, herbicides as a tool in the toolbox, not the silver bullet, okay? Don't 
you know, anytime somebody's trying to give you, oh, this is going to solve, it's not going to do it. Not, not when you have evolution of work here with, with these species, okay? So, but as important tools, no, absolutely, okay? Even if you're kind of against using things like GMOs, they still have a, a, an important role, okay? But that they're going to solve the, you know, famine and all that, that by themselves, no. That's, that's again, my personal opinion there, okay? So what about the economics? Okay, again, overview. This is just very general, but then we can get into details. What, what we have here is the intensity of weed control. Okay, very simple kind of graph. Here's the cost revenue. Okay, so when you have an, you know, in, in terms of a weed issue, so here's the cost of control. Here's the uh, weed density or weed population, whatever injury, crop yield reduction. So here's the cost of your control early on, low densities, low intensity of weed control. You're doing a good job of managing your weed seed bank and so forth. You're doing everything right, rotating crops. This is your cost. Here's re your revenue. Okay, so obviously revenue outpaces your costs. That's what you're looking for. You want to make some profit here. Okay, and at some point, you're going to have a maximum. Okay, where your cost of control, as the intensity of weed control, i.e., you're missing species, you know, you're missing control. Uh, you miss the window of opportunity, your cost, is, you know, you've got to go in twice or you've got to use a more expensive product, okay? The cost increases, yeah, your revenue increases, but the difference might not be as profitable. So you're trying to maximize, okay, your revenue in terms of yield, depending on your crop you're, you're growing, and minimize what your cost is. And, is if, you don't, and, and if your intensity of weed control, i.e., you're pouring everything into this. Uh, you've just gotten really behind in controlling, or you, you're using methods that are not effective, or very expensive methods. Then, and you now have the intensity. You've, your fields are just covered with weeds. Clearly, your cost is going to be substantial as you wait longer and longer, and your revenue. Okay, because this flattens off. This is not a good situation. You're not going to be in business for long. So you want to be in this area. Okay, and this is you know very you know, a kind of a general shape of the curves that you, but I think all of you can understand, you can't be paying more for control than you're going to be taking back over many years. I mean, you could do it for a year, say, hey, I got to do it this year, I'm going to take a loss because I don't want the wheat seed bank for next year and I don't, you know, I just can't afford that. But you do that over five, six years, you're done. I mean, there's no grower that's going to be profitable that's going to, that's going to keep doing that, okay? So, what I, that's why I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm talking about this here, is when you're thinking about the kind of management strategy you have to, obviously the economics are going to, you know, how much are you paying a, a, a uh, you know, independent, uh, you know, herbicide applicator to come in? What is it costing you? How much are you getting for your crop? Is it, is it worth it? Okay? So agronomically it might make sense, but you might actually, you know, agronomically you might say, I don't want the seed bank to go in, so I'm willing to, to pay you know, a lot more than I'm going to get back for this year thinking of next year, okay? But there's only so many years you could do that, unless you're independently wealthy and can do that. Most of the growers I know can't do that for many years, okay? So, what are the current strategies, okay? I'm sure you could have thought of, you know, think these through, okay? These are the general categories, physical control or mechanical, okay? This is, you know, could be manual, so we still hand weed a lot. Some of our very valuable crops are still hand weeded. You know, if you have to go out in any row, certain, you know, rows, if, if weeds have escaped. Okay, chemical control includes herbicide, growth regulators, defoliants, herbicide resistant crops or herbicide tolerant crops, Roundup Ready, Liberty Link crops. Okay, does anybody know what, what defoliants are used for from a... Does anybody know why? What would you use defoliants for? Potatoes are often used, so things like paraquat. If you want, now, potato is not a, not a weed, okay? But you do have sometimes viney type plants that defoliants, or you're just trying to kill the top in orchards sometimes. You don't want to use a, what we call systemic herbicide that might get into the roots of your apple trees or of your fruit trees. And so you'll just spray the vegetation below with a contact, what we call a contact herbicide, like paraquat, that just defoliates the plants. It's not trans, translocated where it might actually get into the roots of your, you know, important crop, okay? So there are situations, but certainly, 
in potatoes, when, when growers want to harvest potatoes and the vines are still green or they want to have, you know, kill them all so it's easier to, to dig up the potatoes, they'll use the foliage. And what's nice about that is that these are contact herbicides, i.e. they're not going to be carried in from the vine into the tuber, which you're trying to sell to people. Okay? That wouldn't be very good. It'll kill your tuber. So you want, it, you want just the above ground foliage to be killed so that you can go in with your harvester. Okay? So that's there. The biological control, we'll talk about. I have a lecture on it. Classical control in, in crop systems, we use mostly what's called the bioherbicide approach. Okay? which as the name suggests closely resembles the use of herbicides. However, you're using, say, fungal pathogens that are very selective against certain weeds. And I, I, my PhD was on the use of bioherbicide, a bioherbicide to control velvet leaf and soybean and corn. So we have this fungus called Colletotricum, if some of you are familiar with, with some of the fungal pathogens, that was very selective, okay? This isolate was very selective for velvet leaf did not touch the corn, did not touch soybean, and it really hammered, okay, and, and I used actually reduced rates of a herbicide, Bazagran, Bentazon, in mixture to see if we had some synergism, and it worked well, and you could tank mix the fungus with the herbicide. So for the grower, that's great. They don't have to go twice, spray, you know, the herbicide or spray the pathogen and then come back. Um, so I'll talk more about that. The classical control is what we use mostly to control invasive species. Okay, where we go back to the country of origin of the weed, usually these are exotic weeds, they're not native to North America. You go back to the country where they come from, and because often there, they're not a problem. These weeds have become a problem here, and the idea being that they left behind their natural enemies. And so we want to go back to Europe or Asia and see if we can find some, some natural enemies that we could bring here, as long as they're safe and they're selective. You don't want to bring something here, creating, you know, trying to solve a problem by bringing another problem that your insect or pathogen jumps to another important crop and they're very specific. APHIS is the group that's going to look at this, is the organization that will look at very carefully what you're going to be bringing in. Okay? Uh, ecological, also referred to as managerial or cultural control, is this whole thing of crop rotation, timing of crop planting, you know, fertilization, you know, the, the agronomic aspects that, that to put your crop ahead of or at a competitive advantage over weeds. And that, unfortunately, is something that's not often, you know, thought about more, with more depth. And, I, and I'll show you the paradigm. I think there's going to, we need to have a paradigm shift in, from weed management perspective and what we do and, and the order that we do things. And then, of course, integrated uses many of these. One, one category that's not here that I'd like to include in there is preventive control, which is going to be the topic of our next chapter, which would fall under this category too, but, you know, managerial preventive control, prevent the, the invasive plant from coming to a natural area in the first place. Prevent wheat seeds from coming into your, your farm if you're bringing in mulch or topsoil from some place. How can you do that? What are some steps you could do at the farm level that could help? Okay? Sorry? Yeah. I mean, kind of, you know, yeah, well, prophylactic. In, in IPM, we use that term, and some of you in the IPM class, obviously, some of this will, will resonate because we cover that, and you can think it's not just weeds, but just pest management. Yeah, how could you avoid even bringing any pest, pathogens, diseases, and so forth, okay? And this is something I'm really big on, which is the integrated. You really need to understand the system. You need to understand your enemy, in a sense, the weeds. What are they? What's the, what, what are the dominant species? What's your system like? Are you carrying out some, you know, cultural practice or management practice that will definitely favor a particular weed species. And how do you, what do you do to keep the weeds off balance? That is going to be always the challenge. You have to tell yourself, if I do the same thing year in, year out, you're, you're going to be lining yourself up for trouble because you're going to have certain weed species that are going to be well adapted to your management threat. So the idea is to always keep the weeds off balance or the particular weed that is, is of concern to you. Okay? So. What I'm, you know, the first thing that somebody says, well, I, you know, how do you start thinking about management, you know, in, from a weed perspective? And one of the things I, I kind of talk about is, okay, well, is the weed already in place or are you worried that something's going to come from elsewhere? So are you dealing with prevention? Are you trying to control something? Are we, if we're looking at invasive species, are you trying to eradicate or even agronomics? It's located in a, in a small area and we want to just jump on it before it gets out, okay? 
And with the movement of you know, feed for animals and so forth, from the Midwest and the Northwest, if you're in turf systems, most of our turf seeds, do you know, it, it is grown in the Northwestern United States and Canada, British Columbia. So it's coming from Oregon and Washington State. Those are the big players in most of our, you know, turf systems and forages and so forth. And so often things are brought in contaminated with species that we have not seen here before. So being alert to new species coming in and preventing them, okay, because you're always going to have a certain number of seeds, even in, you know, certified seed, there are going to be weed seeds. The question is, you know, what are they and, and are they a problem? And, and management, okay? Does anybody know what this is by any chance? I mean, it's what they're trying to do here. Do you know what, what species are? This is a roadside. This is actually Japanese knotweed, okay? Polygonum cuspidatum. We'll, we'll cover that in today's lab, the polygonacy in tomorrow's lab. Japanese knotweed, uh, you know, uh, wild bamboo, some folks call it, okay, big canes, is, is basically they've, they've cut them, then they, there was regrowth, sprayed glyphosate, and now, you know, they're just basically, once the glyphosate is in, the plant was, afterwards, it's just put a real, you know, thick covering along to see, you know, if that can, the, the combination, the integrated control can help. One thing with this plant is I wouldn't, and I, I'd have to ask these folks, Often you'll see the rhizomes go right under this thing and pop up, you know, where it's not being covered. I mean, they can go, you know, tens of feet, 20 feet under and still pop up. So you really have to be vigilant. But I, I thought that was a, you know, a couple of the folks that I know work, work, work on this. Okay? So these are generally our strategies. And, and I'll cover each of those. Okay? We'll cover each of those and spend quite a bit of time on chemical control. Because as I said, 95% of current ag involves the use in some form of a herbicide, whether it's Roundup Ready systems or not. So whether this is something that you say, yeah, it's very important, or yeah, I'm not into herbicides, this is not trying to take sides. I, you need to have the information available, okay? And even if you say, you know, you're you know, staunchly organic or against pesticides, I still want you to be, okay, objective and understand the information such that I don't want things like, and I've heard this before, oh, you know, Roundup, you'll talk to some folks, oh, my dad says you can drink the stuff, no problem. And then others, oh yeah, Roundup, everybody's gonna get cancer uh, tomorrow. S both are totally wrong. Uh, it's probably somewhere in the middle. It's a chemical, so it should be treated as such, okay? But that, that it causes, you know, uh, cancer, that's, the jury's still out. I'm not saying that's the case, but I wouldn't, you know, you touch it tomorrow, you're gone. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the environmental issues and health issues related to that. But really what I'm looking for here is for you to get the information, understand how the herbicide works, how it gets into the plant, how does it leach out, where does it go, so that you can have an intelligent discussion, even if you want to argue the point that, you know, we don't have a use for these things. Or, yeah, this is important in ag, okay? Um, and that to me is, is, is important. So we'll sp spend a fair amount of time on, on chemicals because there are over 300 different herbicides. You, you won't have to know all, you know, but we'll put them in categories, make it easier for you to, to think them through, okay? But really that's to me is what it's all about. And this is usually the, you know, and we'll cover each of these, but you'll see the, the paradigm shift that I'd like to, to talk about. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? In very general terms, okay? And you have this, okay? To me, that should be the basis of all management. Now, you might say, well, I'm already on a farm. I already have, you know, barnyard grass and yellow nuts. Yeah, that's fair enough. But you still may not have that weed in a particular, you may have it in one area of your farm, in one particular field. I don't want you transporting it elsewhere. I don't want your cattle moving from a contaminated field to another field without you understanding that some weed seeds, things like velvety, can go right through the gut of an animal, a ruminant, with very little, you know, disruption of viability. So you need to be aware then, or, or with tillage equipment, you've just come out of a field cultivating, and how many times do I see a grower out of their cultivator, you see the rhizomes of quackgrass hanging there. And they're moving to a field that had never had quackgrass, and I'm thinking, oh man, they're going to, because they don't take the time to at least clean it out, especially if they, they have some, you know, and I had this one grower down in uh, Broome County, beautiful fields except one where he had, you know, he had quackgrass. 
And he's and I went one day and he's moving his equipment to these beautiful fields that have never had any quack. And I'm seeing these rhizomes and he's just spreading out. And I stopped him. You know, I said, hey, man, Joe, what, you know, what are you doing? He said, oh, are those going to be a problem in this other field? I said, man, there's where you can. It's a perennial. This thing, that's how this thing is spread. You know, from then on, he limited it. Still got in, you know, one of the fields. But he says now he's very careful about cleaning it. He even takes his time. But again, time is limiting, and you can't expect to get out and, you know, hose down everything. But um, this is, you know, the advantage is that it prevents introduction or spread of new weeds. And you don't, it doesn't take that much energy, not in the sense that it takes, you know, the person time to clean out their, their pickup or so forth. The problem is, and we'll talk about that, it's in some cases there are specific regulations that don't allow you to, you know, certain, okay, uh, products to come into a state, okay, Kyle, I'm sure you know about those, and Kyle can chime in with, you know, the you know, Weed Seeds Act. There are certain weed seeds that cannot be uh, transported across states, even in other countries and so forth. So they're regular. But the problem is enforcing the regulations, okay? And you don't, you know, weeds not, you know, they're not removed in many cases. Things can still get in, okay? And it's going to still be a problem, okay, because of the difficulty in enforcing. So on paper, it looks good. We're going to ban, you know, there's only a 0.5% chance or within this uh, wheat seed mix or, or crop, wheat seed, uh, crop seed that you're buying for feed or, or for turf, say, there's still a small percentage of contamination in there. So you have to be aware, and that's why I'm saying weeds generally are not going to be removed. So you need to be vigilant, okay? What about physical control, okay? Boat hand labor, okay? Limited energy input, okay? Energy in the sense of uh, fuels, you know, not people-wise. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of energy, okay, going into it. Uh, and environmentally, you know, pretty sound. I mean, it doesn't really destroy the environment as if you're going to be using machinery. Uh, the problem, of course, is availability of labor. I mean, you just have to see, you know, the migrant workers. I mean, who picks most of the cukes? Who picks most of the apples? If some of you are and, you know, your families have those, you know who does it. It's not, you know, local folks. Not, and I, when I was in Canada, I could remember, we had actually, Canada would import, I was working with uh, vegetable farmers and, and some apple orchard folks. We had folks from, you know, Tamils from Sri Lanka that would be, you know, they would fly in, not just Mexicans and so forth. That is a big issue. And folks don't want to do that kind of work, even if you tell them, you know, you get eight bucks an hour or minimum wage. They don't want any of that, okay? I'm not saying everybody, but I know most of you know why this is, this is happening. And this is not starting to happen in developing countries. They're having trouble now, okay? Anybody's, you know, on a farm or something, or owns a farm or operations where you, migrant workers are part of it? Yeah, and, you know, with, you know, immigration issues, you know, all that, that that's going on. It's, you know, a lot of the fruit often, you know, if you don't pick it, it rots right on there. It's, it's just huge. It's one of the biggest issues that I think a lot of folks don't realize how much that's, you know, is an issue. Um, and, you know, of course, machinery is, is good, but timing, if it's wet or you're busy with your cattle, you don't have time to get in there and start, you know, managing your weeds or your, your haying. So that that's becomes machinery. And, and, and I'll show you a video on this in, in one of our labs. Managerial or cultural control, again, very environmentally sound, limited energy. So this involves things like crop rotation. You know, better managing fertilizer regimes. I mean, it doesn't take that much. It's information intensive. You need to be knowledgeable. Problem is implementing them, okay? And, uh, and level of control. How good is the control? Uh, you might know that it's important. You know, I should be rotating out of a corn. I've had it for three years, and we talked about this in IPM. Um, and you should really be going into a cereal, okay, or, or some other a forage. But you're not going to do it because this year corn prices are at the highest they've been in a long time. So agronomically it, and biologically it makes sense for you to, to, to rotate, but you're not going to do it from an economic perspective. And this happens, guys. This is very, very common. I've worked with growers where they're going to say, hey, this is my time. You can't blame them, you know, except for the last few years. Many times, these, you know, many of our growers were losing money. So you can't tell them, hey, if this is the one year in 10 that prices are, are decent, to tell them, well, you know, you can't be in corn this year because, you know, on, based on your rotation, you should be going to, to, you know, to wheat this year. That happens, okay? So that's, that's where the implementation, sometimes, like, you know, the economics come in 
or agronomically, it's just not, not feasible to do it, okay? You want to do an intercrop, for example, where you have a legume in, in, a, in a monocot, and you know, you've, you're, you've got to harvest them, you need two pieces of equipment, they don't mature at the same time, uh, fertilization is not the same, you've got a legume, you can't put too much fertilizer down, or at least nitrogen fertilizer, because that might inhibit nodulation. So all of that is, is, makes it a little tougher at a large scale to do it. I'm not saying it's not possible. I think it is possible, but you've got to, you've got to think that through. Biological, which is something I've worked on quite a bit, low energy input, definitely environmentally sound. There's some debate, and some people are worried about, and I'm going to use the term you know, loosely, um, humans playing God and bringing insects from elsewhere to put the uh, ecosystem in balance, i.e. a weed was brought here by accident or purposely, and we're going to bring, try to put the system in balance by bringing an insect or a pathogen that controls or a virus that controls that weed. Uh, that, some folks are not comfortable with that. That, that, you know, that shouldn't be done. If, if the pathogen or insect's already here, that's a little more, you know, um, for most people, it may, it's not as problematic. But when you have to purposely bring stuff, the argument is, hey, we brought the crops purposely, we brought the ornamentals, so why not? I mean, the world's already a mix of everything. But I'm just putting that out, okay? But the problem with biological is that often it targets a single species. So the pathogen I was using, it only targeted velvet leaf. So, you know, unless that's the only weed you've got in your field or the main weed, which is sometimes is the case, but if I've got a mix of weed species, I've got barnyard grass, I've got foxtails in there, I've got pigweed, it, it's not going to do much. It's going to knock off my, my velvet leaf, but it's going to be taken over by some other weed. So that's a limitation. And again, limited research. I mean, there isn't much money that's put towards that, although it's an important step. Now, organic growers are very, very interested in this because often they, they might have just one or two key species that through cultivation they can't really control or through other cultural techniques, okay? Finally, chemical control, okay, herbicides, high level of control. One of the things that was always disheartening working in biocontrol is that they always, okay, compared you to, well, how well does your biocontrol agent, how well does it match up with, with a Roundup or with a, you know, selective type herbicide? Because the, the, you say what you want, but herbicides are tremendously effective. They get 95 to 100 percent control if used properly and properly timed. There's nobody's going to argue how effective these things are, okay? And the, the network, if any of you worked with industry, I mean, well-developed from the time a molecule is first identified through the network of testing and finally a product that's available, okay? Tremendous high energy to, you know, to make these. I mean, some of these products do require a lot of energy and, of course, the environmental risks. There are environmental risks. There's no question about it. Some of these products have gotten into the water table. Some have been linked to health issues, okay? And we'll talk a bit about that when we, we get there. But this gives you kind of a sense of the pros and cons, and I'm sure most of you can probably figure that that's, that would have been the case. This is where I think there, there needs to be a paradigm shift, okay? Right now, and Roundup Ready systems, you know, this, this use of uh, herbicide and soybean one time, once the weeds are up, okay, which has become the mainstay of weed management in the Midwest and the Northeast and pretty well across North America, it, we are setting ourselves up for disaster from a weed management perspective. And to me, it means we haven't learned anything from past mistakes, which is if you reverse this triangle, put this up here, okay, and controlling growing weeds down here, that's what the current system is like, i.e., we put all of our efforts right now, you look at it, you look at most growers, conventional growers, there's no doubt about it. There are the few that I could say don't do it, but most of them, controlling weeds, that's their main, they're going to control them once they're up, and they're going to rely almost solely on herbicides, okay? And that is, and then they'll have, you know, prevent, if that's not the case, some of them are at least going to put down a, what we call a residual, a pre-emergent herbicide which they coat the soil surface with so that as seeds, wheat seeds germinate and try to emerge, they get killed. And you'll see some of the herbicides in lab that do that. They basically don't allow, they form a film on the soil surface. So you don't mix the soil up with the herbicide. You just spray it right on the surface. So the weeds haven't emerged yet, okay? But the growers prefer using what's called post-immersion. When the weed's there, they'll go in with something like Roundup or glyphosate. That is their mainstay. 
this is next. In their, you know, they'll say, okay, well, if I can't get those, at least I'm going to put this pre-emerge. This is last thing on their minds. And I'm not saying this in a pejorative, you know, I mean, I, I, I understand why they, that's last. And that should be the total opposite. We should be focusing efforts at a farm level or field level at this in this kind of order. Prevent production of seeds and perinating, you know, structures of, of weeds. Use that, use all the, and we'll talk about prevention, cultural control, bio control, you name it, to focus here. Don't get those things getting in there in the first place. Then, okay, if some will get in, prevent them from emerging. And you could use herbicides, I mean, just not a, you know, flame weeding, rotor tillers, okay, rotary hose for organic growers, and you'll see some of this equipment, okay. And then lastly, those that make it through, then you focus on those. But your energy, the size of this should be where most energy is put. And right now, it is not being put. It's, we're taking the easy way, I mean, and again, I understand where girls are coming from in terms of time and so forth. But from a biological weed management perspective, it is not the way to do it. We're always going to be, because we're depending on these herbicides, and now we're running into problems with resistance. And what are we going to do? So yes, Jeff. You're saying that farmers are controlling growing weeds in the most, because obviously they're the ones which are competing with their crops and reducing their yields. But obviously, if you don't, if you say apply all of, or you know, the majority of your effort down towards preventing production of seeds, well, effectively that is controlling growing weeds. Is in fact, if you let that go at all, if you let that slip, then you end up with a massive addition to the ceiling. Oh. So, I mean, it, it really, to me, seems like less of a paradigm shift and more of a just an increased emphasis on on weed management in its entirety. Like, oh, you know, instead of just sort of Shooting, yeah. Oh, right, right. I, I mean, by no means am I saying, you know, uh, take all the effort. I mean, yeah, you're going to have stuff come. But if this was a greater focus, right. if growers were going in thinking, hey, you know, what are the things that I can do to prevent these plants from coming in, whether they're seeds and so forth, what can I do at the farm or field level? And then think, okay, yeah, there's going to be some that are already there are going to be, what can I do next? And then, yes, some are going to come out. Now, by no means am I saying, you know, the ones that pop up, hell, yeah, let them go, because they're going to, even two velvet leaf plants for fur grower are going to destroy you, and no grower is going to have that. But what I'm saying is right now, this is often not even on the radar. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, and then by no means all growers, so don't, you know, if you say, hey, no, I, I'm, I'm on a farm, I, know, I think about this. Sometimes I don't have the energy to do it or enough to, to labor, but I, I'm aware of that. But even just being aware is already... Bigger part. I mean, I'm telling you, I, you know, when I meet with growers and you show them the stuff, they're going, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, but, but they don't do it first. But again, right, maybe not a complete reversal of this, but certainly worthy emphasis. And that's what I really i am trying to get at is put that energy or the focus here. Certainly these are going to be important. You know, you're not going to have a clean field. I know one grower, and some of you might know the Nor Nordells. They're organic growers in northeastern Pennsylvania that I basically have not seen really any weeds, even in their onions, onion field. They do, you know, but they work, you know, they're so intense on what they do. And their main, you know, the pedestal, I mean, what really keeps them going? Right, this. This is what they focus a bit. Remember when we went out to, to the Freeville farm and Brian and Chuck Moeller was, was talking about one of the management techniques was to prevent the fallow period that one year, um, they, they just grow cash crops. One out of every two years. Now, not everybody can afford to do that. If, if land is expensive and so forth, or you don't have enough land, but that's what they do. The one year that the, the farm or the field is not in production, apart from cover crops and so forth, they have a summer fallow. They stimulate germination from tillage, and then, boom, two weeks later, cultivate. And they keep doing that, so basically draw down the wheat seed bank. And, I mean, I've been amazed that, that they can't, you know, don't have really, the seed bank is almost gone. I mean, it's it's... And you have to see it to believe it. I, I never thought I would see something like that. Okay, yeah, they have three, four acres. It's not, you know, 2,000 acres. But at the same time, it, it, it is doable. I'm not saying that all of our girls should do that. But I, it just goes to show you that if there's a greater emphasis on this, then we're ahead of the game. Okay? Does so anybody kind of get the... So this is, you know, at the end of the day, when you're thinking integrated, start with this. And this is true of any pest. You could be working with diseases, with insect pests, this is not just weeds, okay? It's hard. I'm not, I'm, you know, because you don't see the results right away. 
That's the when I spray, you know, you get the girls spraying Roundup, boom, they see it. And even Roundup, actually, they don't see it as fast as they, they think they, they want to see it. Okay? So, this is, uh, I don't know if you, you have this. Do you have this five-step approach? You may not have it. Again, you don't have to. I've included this kind of last minute just to, from a practical perspective. Okay? You, you can. Okay? If not, I can certainly, you know, copy it and get it to you. Okay? This is, if you're going to be dealing with a, you know, how do you solve a weed problem? And remember I told you we, there's a, a Northeast, you know, graduate student weeds competition, you know, where you actually, they put you in the position of being an extensionist, you know, working for a cooperative extension or you're working for, a, uh, you know, a chemical company or the Nature Conservancy and so forth. Um, your approach to solving a problem is, tells them a lot about how you're, you're thinking. But one of the things you need to do is, is kind of think, Okay, try to figure out the problem. Somebody calls you up to their farm, okay, and they say, I've got a problem. You know, I've got, you know, and, and whatever that specific problem. So this is the kind of the first step. What's the diagnosis? I think this is almost like any detective story or medical field, okay? Weeds. What weeds are they dealing with? Okay? Uh, what species? What's their abundance? How are they distributed? Are they in one part of the field? Are they throughout the field? Okay? Again, why did I put so much emphasis on you knowing the, the, the life habit? Why should you know that barnyard grass is an annual and quiet grass is a perennial that reproduces by rhizomes? It's because that's going to help you in thinking about how you're going to manage this. What is the life cycle? Is this an annual? Is this a biannual? Okay? All of this is important information. Okay? Environmental social hazards. Just be aware. You know, if you're going to be doing spraying, you know, what are... And you know enough about the, the herbicide. Say this is something you know about. Nearby crops. Is it, you know, am I going to have a problem with drift if I apply this product? You know, I've got, uh, I'm going to use something called dicamba, okay, in, in corn. And I've got soybean next, you know, 100 feet away. And it's 90, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, some of you might say, so what's the big deal? But, you know, if you would have experience and you would know, oh, no, this is a product, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that, will volatilize. When it's very hot, over 90, 85 degrees, the product will just basically go in, in gaseous phase and be moved by wind and land on the soybean, and the soybeans get hammered. It's just, it, they're susceptible. And, and I've seen it. So those are, you know, am I spraying a herbicide that, and I'm close to a you know, body of water? That's true for agronomics, especially for invasive species where you're looking at rare species. You're usually, you know, some of the work we're doing in near Lake Ontario, you can't just go in there and start spraying herbicides or even a biocontrol agent without being aware of what's there. Is there a school? So the hazards. You have, need to know about your soils because these herbicides will interact with soils. Some of them are going to be uh, adsorbed to soil and won't be active. You put them, if you're organic matter, you're working in muck soils. Near Batavia, for example, very different soils than typically we'll have down here. Okay? And so being aware of that, and hopefully most of you have taken a soils course so you can, you know, at least understand that. Uh, crop management systems, what do you have available? Okay. Past results if you've used this management tactic. Okay. What are your short-term goals? Is the short-term goal to wipe out that, to work in that field and, and remove that weed? Or is it, oh, this is going to be over a number of five, five, six years. The grower wants to wean off you using this particular herbicide or management strategy, okay? So, I mean, it's, they're general, but these are the kind of things you need to be thinking about in your particular case. And not all of them will apply, okay? So don't, re, you know, if you're thinking about a problem, say, well, that's not going to be the case for me. But some of these are going to be applicable, okay? So afterwards is survey available practices, you know? What, take a look at what are, what are other folks doing around the area? What are they using? What kind of equipment? Are the weeds that you're interested in being controlled? How consistent? Is it one every five years that it works? You know, that, that'll tell you. Any environmental impacts? Okay. What's your window? You know, the grower only has two weeks to do this. You now know a little bit about the critical period of weed control. Um, you know, what is the availability of, of a particular strategy? Yeah, I want to use this herbicide. Is it even available? Is it even registered in New York? Because that each state legislates, you know, the use of pesticides or a piece of equipment you want to use. Does somebody have it? Okay. And of course, what's the cost? What is it going to cost?
to carry this out. And that the grower is always going to want to know that kind of information. If you're a uh, custom applica applicator for them or you're going to do tillage for them, they want to know that information. Okay, how much is it going to cost? Is it, is it worth it? So diagnose the problem, what's available, okay, what is it? And there's, there's more to that in terms of availability. And then you pick the program. Hopefully, you have enough experience. And again, some of you are going to say, I mean, I don't know what to pro Just this is, I'm giving you kind of the putting the cart before the horse type thing, just to kind of give you a sense of where you're going to go with the kind of information I've provided you, okay, or will provide you in the uh, coming lectures. Okay, what's the cost effectiveness, uh, the timeliness of impact? I mean, you know, I'm going to carry out this, this treatment, but is it really going to impact my crop? Or I'm so, you know, my window is so off that I'm doing this, but I'm, my, I'm pretty well wasting my money. You know, I just have, I, the better thing would have been to plow under this, you know, the crop or something. And that happens. Um, in some of these contests, for example, um, if the, um, the grower, you know, in some cases the growers used the wrong herbicide or the timing wasn't right, one of the questions that the student has to answer is what do you recommend to the grower this year when you're talking to them, which usually the contest is in July, and what do you recommend for next year, okay? So you want to be able to tell, you know, is, well, this year, forget it, it's over. Or no, you could save the crop, you could do this, remedy, here's your uh, remedy. Or no, plow it under, but next year this is what you need to do. So that's going to come from experience. I mean, some of you can't just you know, roll off your heads. But um, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to be thinking about. Uh, are you availability and time? Think about, don't start thinking of some management strategy that's going to take you forever or it's not available. And it's going to take you time to bring a piece of equipment from the Midwest or something. Okay, That's just not going to make it. And best fit for your objectives. And I can't emphasize the objectives part. People get in and try to solve problems. Without, well, what am I trying to do here? Is it just short term, trying to get this weed out of my crop, or longer term? Okay? So, and then, of course, executing the pro, you know, program. And this is something that often is not done. That's not done in biological control. It's one of our, you know, we always talk about this. It's a follow up. And if you've worked in the chemical industry with industry, you always return back to the grower or whoever you worked with and you say, hey, how did the product work? Let me take a look at the field or, you know, certain mechanical piece of equipment that was being used, okay? You scout, you take a look at what, what does the field look like now? Uh, did, did it do? Appropri any remedial, oh, we've got some weeds that, that came through. We missed them with the cultivator or, or the herbicide. We don't know what's going on or could this be a case of herbicide resistance? Okay, that's when you do that. You monitor yield. What's, I mean, obviously, this is what the grower is looking at. What's the impact? I mean, has it helped any or, or the timing off? Mapping for next year. Okay, and that's where GIS, GPS, if any of you haven't taken it and you still have a chance to take those kinds of courses, I'll say that that's probably one of the skills that most employers would like to see in our students is, is GIS, GPS technology, understanding of that for any pest management scouting. So if you get a chance... Try to take, of course, how many of you have taken GIS or GPS? You should. The job offers that I see come across my desk, they always ask for that. Ability to write, communicate, know the subject matter, but that's one. You know, if you're a pesticide applicator, if you're certified or know something about, you know, pesticides, that helps. But that's the next one. Right under, they often talk about that because that's just a great skill to have. So put that down, you know, if, if ever you find a, a little spot that you can, you can use. Okay? I like to be realistic, but also I want to think forward. I'd like for you guys to be thinking as you kind of embark after you get done at Cornell or continue on is, 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 you know, be realistic as to what technology can deliver. And like I said, if somebody's trying to sell you the silver bullet, don't bite, okay? It has not happened, you know, it's not gonna happen. It might happen short term, but it's not. So, okay, think in terms of programs, not treatments. Think broader. Don't think about a specific weed. Think about a weed community. What are the kind of weeds? Oh, I've got a bunch of monocots, mixed combination. Not just, ah, oh, there's red root pigweed. That's what I'm targeting. Because you target that, you're going to have shifts. Okay? Think about life cycles, not the weed species. Oh, I'm getting annuals. I'm getting a mix of annuals per annuals. What can I do? Cultivation. And I'll talk about each of these when we cover each of the sections. I'll say, see here, this is where you can't be thinking about an individual species. You've got to think about the life habit of the, your assemblage, 
okay? Think medium long term, okay? Often we think short term, and I cannot blame some of the growers. I mean, they're just trying to, you know, a few years back they were just trying to stay above water, and now with all the financial crisis, who knows what's going to happen, okay? So I know why they were thinking short term. I just need to get my crop, and I need to get some money for next year to send my kid to college and so forth. But you really need to think longer term, plan ahead, okay? And again, I don't care what management strategy I'll talk to you about or you will find out in the coming years, weeds are not going to disappear, pests are not going to, you're going to have shifts. And so you need to carry out what's called adaptive management. And that's where information is valuable, not just, and that's why I don't just make you memorize, you know, how do I control field bindweed in an orchard and I give you the recipe? That you can find anywhere. But understanding how the herbicide work, the family, the modes of action, that is valuable. Information is valuable, not the recipe. The recipe, you could look it up, okay? So this is, you know, more philosophy, but this is the time to do it before I get, in, I get into the details, okay? So that, that part of it, okay? So that gives you kind of an overview, okay? So what I want to do now is use the rest of the period to talk a little bit about We'll get into the first category that I really want you to think about and give you some on-farm strategies to prevent weeds from coming in. Some are basic, and you should, but you'd be surprised how many people actually don't even think about them. Okay? Uh, let me just move this off here. Okay. So, preventive control of weeds. To me, this is the basis of any weed management, or even, for that matter, pest management, okay? So, here's a picture some of you saw it at IPM. I was down in uh, Arizona at the border crossing, Nogales, okay? Just south of Tucson. And I think I might have mentioned, this is where 85% of all of our vegetables in the United States and Canada come through. This is the, the point, and what these, these are guys that are working for APHIS, the USDA APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, folks. And I've mentioned in the IPM class that this organization is part of the USDA and now also part of the Homeland Security Department. They're the ones that inspect anything coming into the country related to ag. You know, when they tell you you need to keep your vegetables, but, you know, anything back, these are the folks. They hire a lot of folks with your kind of expertise. So if you go on their website, and I think I have the website, look for employment opportunities. Um, really excellent federal jobs with, at bachelor degree level, master's degree levels with folks that are interested in ag, interested in traveling, because you work at all different border crossing, interested in pests in general. So if you've had a weeds, which you're having, uh, whether it's IPM, plant path, or, or entomology, any of those, those are really helpful, okay? But what these folks were doing when I was down there is inspecting uh, mango coming from Mexico for Mediterranean fruit fly, which is a real, real bad problem, particularly in Florida and, and, and uh, California, okay? And they were just, there's a tractor trailer. They were, the guys here told me they inspect maybe 0.5% of everything that comes in, just because there's so much. When I was there, I mean tractor trailer after tractor trailer coming in, okay? And uh, as I, I may have mentioned again, and sorry if I have to repeat this, but um, when products come in from Mexico, they could only be driven with 10 miles within the United States. And then the Mexican trucks have to stop, dump it into a warehouse, the trailer, and return back to Mexico. That's where the U.S. truckers and Canadian truckers pick it up and deliver it to the U.S. and Canada. They do not allow the Mexicans to transport the produce. And you might have seen this in the news, and, and the, the argument was that their trucks were not fit to be on U.S. or Canadian roads, which you look at some of the trucks. In fact, some of the companies are owned by the U.S. and, and Canadian folks. So, but it's, it's, it's a, a sore point between the countries. And, but yeah, I was amazed to see these warehouses with these hundreds of trucks, and I said, what were they doing here? And then the fellow explained to me that, that uh, this was now a few years back, so I don't know if it's changed, but... It's not. You talk to these guys, it, they're doing their best. They're undermanned. There's so much product coming in. There's so much, you know, um, 
pressure, economic pressure, not to stop the project. Because what happened? I mean, you stopped the stuff. What, you know, you know how many, would they stop everybody else? But obviously, you've seen what's happened when you do get contamination. The spinach, the, the tomato issue. I mean, and, and the other thing, of course, is when that happens, they put a lot of other people out of business because people are not going to buy spinach. They're going to buy, you know, bell peppers. They don't know where it's coming from, and it spreads in the media. I'm not saying from a safety perspective. So, yeah, it's, there's no question that 0.5% or 1% of stuff coming in is, is, is just not enough. To, you know, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. I mean, you can't do it. I mean, they're doing their best, but so the other thing is that they're not going to look for the pest itself. What the, the next best thing is to look at products that may contain the pest that you're looking for. So in this case, they were looking at mango. They weren't looking for the fruit flies themselves, but there's uh, you know telltale signs of the larvae within you know the fruit and stuff. But yeah, I mean, they would look at maybe pull 25 of those those boxes from part of a trailer and there's 30 tractor trailers in 10 minutes that already had come into the country. So what do you do after? I'm, you know, just, but you've got to do it. I mean, you've got to do it somewhere. But uh, again, the likelihood is that things are going to make it in, as much as I say. And that's at the, at the country level, but also at the farm and field level. You know, I don't think I have a girl that's going to say, oh, no, no, no weeds are going to come into my field. I mean, I, I'm not unrealistic. But we need to think about that, okay? But these are the strategies within prevention. And again, I apologize to the EPM folks because we just covered regulatory. But this is very similar. So if you haven't been in the course, this is what we talk about. Prevention, you're basically trying to stop a given species from contaminating an area. Okay? I don't have yellow nutsedge in my field. I don't want it in. Okay? You're trying to prevent it from coming in an area or into the country. Okay? There is a federal noxious plant list that there are some certain species that are legislated that can't be it. Same with weed seeds in particular, okay? Certain species are, are you know, very uh, small percentage is acceptable, okay? Control, and so what I want to talk about is, is what is the difference, okay? Control management, the process of reducing weed infestations. So I like the word management better than control. Uh, the impact of weed, usually by reducing them. I mean, it's very, very similar. People use them synonymously. Um, Control, I guess, is, you know, I'm going to control managing it. Because control means, I mean, to me, it would be wiping them all out. Uh, that's not usually the case. We, have, I don't have, we don't have too many examples of eradication of a weed. Okay? So, uh, but these are the, the terms that I want you to be aware of. Okay? Um, eradication, you want to remove a weed completely from a given area, i.e., which weed? Striga, which is a parasitic weed. There are eradication programs that are ongoing right now in the Carolinas, in Arkansas, where that plant is a real issue, okay? And so they don't want it to get out. Remember, this plant is parasitic. It attacks cereal monocots. Real serious problem in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, problem in Asia, India. Major, major problem. Over half a million seeds, microscopic seeds produced by this plant. But it is not, does not photosynthesize. It attaches to the roots of your crops and wipes them out. By the time you see the weed come on, it's a beautiful plant. I'll show you a picture. You say, what a beautiful plant. In the snapdragon family, Scrophulariaceae, same family as toad flax or butter and eggs. You see it, you go, wow, pretty, but it's done its damage. Your corn, your millet start gone. And so the USDA aphis is really trying to eradicate, get rid of them. Quarantine, you want to exclude a pest from a given area, okay? So for, you know, from the uh, insect point of view, Asian longhorn beetle that's in, in the New York area, New York City, Chicago area, they've quarantined that they're trying to keep areas around it from getting this Asian longhorn beetle or emerald hatch borer, okay, or striga, okay? So that's the quarantine. And containment is kind of the opposite. You know, quarantine is keep it from getting into other areas. Containment is... I want to just keep it there. Don't let it get out of New York City or don't let it get out of uh, the, you know, the, the dock in, in Chicago, you know, the harbor where, where this thing came in, actually in, in untreated crates, wood from China. That's, that's where, you know, some of you might know the story. Okay? So just be, be familiar with this. This is, okay, basic information on... What can be done? There are, there's legislation that will prohibit some things from getting in. You have no choice. Is the, is the law enforced? That's the problem. Okay? 
We used to have laws up in Canada that, that um, basically prohibited any landowner from having common ragweed on their land, on their, in their front yards, okay? And you were, first time you were caught, you were given just a little, you know, tap saying, hey, you got to get it off. If you didn't, the second time you're supposed to be charged $1,000, okay? So you know what happened? A lot of the, this was up in Montreal, a city of four million people. The local government, okay, the municipal government, the city government, um, they were negligent on their own land, okay? And so folks that were, had been sued basically went to court, class action suit against the city saying, hey, you're charging us, you know, and, and fining us for having, a, what about your, you know, vacant lots and so forth, you know? around the city that you're not taking, why are you not doing? They won their case, and this killed all the kind of the environmentalists and other folks there. Instead of the city basically, um, you know, saying, okay, we'll clean up our act, they abolished the bylaw. Man, the, 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 there's actually a ragweed group there, action group, because a lot of folks suffer from it. But, you know, that was, so talk about law, you know, this is the issue with law enforcement. It comes and goes, even though we have some regulations, they're in place, but they're not enforced. And that becomes, that's an issue, okay? So, but we do have quarantines and there is legislation at hand, okay, that should be the first line of defense. How good is it? As, you, as I said, if you're just looking at 0.5% of things coming in, the likelihood is it's not going to be too good. This is, okay, striga, which we, the, the flowers can also be, okay, could be pink, purple, it's uh, near a corn plant, so you'll see it come out. If you would look below ground, it's attached. It's like a fungus. Filaments attaching to the corn roots. It actually, the seeds detect, you know, roots of monocots, and that stimulates germination. They attach to them, okay? Too bad they don't have a shot of the corn plant, because this thing is going to be chlorotic in no time, okay? And so there is, there's an eradication program in South Carolina, North Carolina, okay, that's been going on. Uh, since uh, I think the 60s. It's taking a long time. And in fact, I may have said this, it was a graduate student from India where the plant is very common that was at NC State, I think he was at NC State doing his PhD, that was, you know, working in one of the, you know, the fields for his, for his PhD degree and walked around and saw the plant and alerted or mentioned it to the major professor say, hey, you know, that we have that plant in India. And the professor, you know, what, what plant? Went, never seen it before. They don't know how it got there, okay, certainly, um, and there, that, after that, USDA APHIS, boy, started, you know, eradication program. Quarantine, first thing is quarantine, make sure it doesn't get out, but it's still ongoing. They're trying to minimize, okay, the cost is enormous. Remember I was saying this, this was a real concern for, for APHIS and, and, you know, the whole issue of bioterrorism. Um, if ever you, one wanted to do real damage to any economy that's growing monocots, this is the plant, the seeds you'd like to spread. Okay? Not giving you guys ideas. I mean, this is a concern. It's, it's out there, and the APHIS folks knew that, that this was, was a problem with this plant. Okay? But, um, but again, um, you know, right now it's, it's been limited. It is in the country, and there are a number of species. Okay? So, um, noxious weeds, there's legislation. Federal legislation that basically will define there are some species that are considered noxious weeds, okay, and um, these have a legal, you know, definition. But a noxious weed is a plant or plant product that can directly or indirectly injure or cause damage to crops, livestock, okay, or other interests of ag, irrigation, navigation. So very very broad term, but so don't think it's only in agronomy. It's, it can affect aquatic systems, natural areas. Irrigation, livestock, poisonous plants, right? This is, this is what that definition is about. So what's some of the legislation that's in place? I don't want to, you know, get into the heavy legislation, but just a couple of things that you should be aware of, okay? Legislation regarding weed species, their spread and so forth, fall under a piece of legislation called the Plant Protection Act, the PPA, okay? There were a bunch of other acts that were around before they consolidated all of these various, the Federal Noxious Weed Act, the Plant Quarantine Act, they consolidated, they were just all over the place and consolidated and made one major 
Act, which was it's called the Plant Protection Act. So all legislation regarding federal, you know, movement of wheat seeds from one part of the country to another or from other countries falls under this. And the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, can prohibit movement, okay, of certain species from state to state, okay. And that is that is like, and that includes biological organisms. So as I mentioned, if I'm in Europe and I want to bring a pathogen because I think it's going to control velvet leaf here. I can't just decide how I'm going to put it in my pocket and get over here. You have to go through the, per per, you know, get the permits, phyto phytosanitary permits, everything. You cannot, you could be put in jail and spend some time, quite a bit of time actually, if they, you, you purposely do that, okay? And again, it's administered by APHIS, Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, uh, APHIS, which is part of the USDA and now part of the Homeland Security Department. Again, you can see why, why the link. So, very closely tied in, tied in with customs. But again, the key here is to think about the Plant Protection Act as, as the legislation that enforces APHIS from stopping you when you come from overseas or you're coming from Hawaii back on the mainland. And they say, hey, no, you can't bring that, you know, go back. That's legally that they can do it. So Bob? Is, it, is there a step that has to declare a noxious weed like an endangered species? Oh, uh, how it makes it to the list? Yes. Yes. Typically, it's, it's um, you know, in, in some cases, right, endangered species, there's, uh, there is an invasive species council that's a government body that includes federal, state, and local authorities. They meet um, every couple, uh, couple of times a year and look at what the latest possible additions that, that maybe, uh, you know, conservation clubs, organizations have proposed. Uh, and say, hey, you know, this species should be on that list. You know, this is a threat. Um, it's, or in many cases, the, the species isn't here yet, but it's, the likelihood is it may get here. And so to prohibit even it making over here so that APHIS folks in the point of origin can be looking at, hey, there's this problem pest in China or Australia that we do not want here. They put that on the federal list. There, and usually it has to involve economics. There's, you know, obviously economic ramifications, health, any health ramifications. But usually how it would impact agriculture. And, and now more and more we're seeing how it impacts the environment through rare species, endangering, you know, unique ecosystems. So, yes, there's a step. It's not just I, I can, I propose it, but it has to go on the list and you have to back it up with. And there are going to be, there's going to be open discussion because you're going to have some stakeholder groups say, hey, what do you mean you're going to ban, you know, this is important. We're seeing this in the ornamental nursery industry. So if you look at some of these lists that they, they want to include as being invasive, most nurserymen would, would go crazy because, uh, you know, on there is uh, burning bush, periwinkle, you know, some of their number one species, although these are, you know, and there's a lot of debate going on between the groups, okay? Uh, Kyle, do you have anything to add to that in terms of just legislation-wise, in terms of wheat seeds that you've, you've dealt with? Well, this, what you've addressed is basically the federal level. Right. Each state has its own sort of the same kind of thing, but at a state level. Right. Which is where I am, which is completely different than the federal level. Exactly. So kind of there's the, 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 federal, the federal level, and then you've got the, these, other, these other groups. But I just want to show you this because it ties in. In terms of weed laws, and I'm not necessarily referring to weed seeds because I think New York State does have a weed seed law, but in terms of just having plants in a list considered noxious, not at the federal level, I, and it might be hard on your map to, to see this, but this is, these are weed laws, i.e. banning certain species, saying, hey, these species are a threat to agriculture, okay? Look at these states, and some of them, and look at New York State. It just blew me away when I saw this. You have every Canadian province, most U.S. states, especially California, okay? These lighter colors, the tiered noxious weeds. So, so those species, those states that are, you know, white basically, uh, unshaded, are those that have no weed lists, okay? That i.e., there's, you can't go to them and say, hey, you need to get rid of that plant. That's a noxious plant. Not even at the federal level. This is at the, the state level because none of them are at the... the there, you know, so you could supersede the, the federal level. In fact, at the state level, they're even more particular, especially in California and Florida. They're so big in ag. Yes? I think yeah. that since 2000, there's actually been a lot of change in the states that have no natural sweet listings. All the Right. New York State has not. 
I mean. Yeah, they're starting, but it's not at the state level. I've been talking to the ag and markets people, and they're, the people are pushing them to include it. But you're absolutely right. They're going to move. We uh, have, this state does have a noxious weed list. There's 11 species on it, but this state's law is very wimpy in regards to those noxious weeds. So we have a, a list, right, but, you actually but, sent me. but you can have up to a certain amount of those noxious weeds as long as they're on the label, which is up to 10 seed per pound. So if you claim it on your label, it can be there. Right. Right. Other states just say no, no way. way. We won't allow any products. So okay. Okay. the ramifications of this is those, those states in white tend to be, are probably dumping grounds for the other states that have seeds they can't sell elsewhere, so they go to your state. Exactly, exactly. And that's why ag and markets are being pressured to, to if you're going to have this legislation in force. Okay? So, the is, we'll continue this next class, so don't forget to have this afternoon.